Hi, and welcome to The Light Leaders, a podcast for light workers who want more money, power, and impact. I'm your host, Alex E. Lember. I believe that we are currently in the middle of a global awakening of humanity and that leveraging entrepreneurship is the fastest way to raise the consciousness of our planet. So in this podcast, I interview light workers and conscious entrepreneurs who follow their soul mission and have built a business around it. I call them light leaders, and this is the new paradigm. You will hear their stories and more importantly, receive tools, tips, and strategies on how you can also impact more people and grow your business while following your soul mission. If you hear little nuggets you love and you'd like to share, screenshot this episode and share on your Instagram stories. Make sure to tag us at the Light Leaders Podcast and we will repost. Hey, before we jump into that interview, there is a phone. I really want to talk to you about this one. It's called the Clear Phone. So it's not run by Google or by Apple. It's a different operating system. It's a really good smartphone and I'm really excited about it because if you have educated yourself on what happens to your data when you use Apple and Google, well, often they will use your data and sell it to advertiser and use so much of it. So this is a phone that's encrypted and decentralized and um, you actually, it's run on the blockchain. I'm super passionate about it. It's also a really good smartphone. They ship almost everywhere in the world. So if you're interested, go to thelightleaders.org slash clear phone, clear like it's clear phone, and you'll find more information there. You can also become like me, a brand ambassador. I'm so passionate about it. So yeah, see you there and enjoy this episode. Hi, and welcome to this new episode of The Light Leaders. Today, I'm with Margot Anand. She is the world's leading authority on Tantra, an internationally acclaimed author, a public speaker, teacher, and seminar leader. Her best-selling books have sold more than a million copies worldwide, and this is her latest book, Love, Sex, and Awakening. Her teaching style is a rare synthesis of French erotic humor, American pragmatism, and Indian mysticism. She is particularly appreciated for her ability to bring healing, lightness, fun, and passion to the workshop atmosphere. Among many other things, she is the founder of many sky dancing Tantra Institutes, a new approach to Tantra. Sky dancing Tantra is, according to her, the most complete path to sexual bliss for Western lovers. Margot has been interviewed and quoted in prestigious publications such as the Wall Street Journal and Time and many others. She studied directly with many masters and the main one was Osho. She has taught along with many masters, including Tony Robbins, Ram Dass, and Deepak Chopra. I'm super honored to have you, Margot. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with a good friend and uh, to see what is going to come. Yeah, I'm very excited. I've had uh, several people talk about Tantra, but again, you're, you're probably in the world a leading figure, so I'm so honored to, to have you, and we even uh, spent some time together in the past few days also, and I learned so much from you, so thank you. And I'm very excited for the listeners to have a little, a little bit of that in the next 40 minutes also. Margot? Important question, what are you grateful for today? I am grateful to be at my advanced age and to have done sufficient work on the physical, uh, emotional, and spiritual level that I can have a healthy body that is without pain because I have emerged from four years of disability. So I am grateful to have rediscovered the body as my ultimate psychedelic uh, friend and uh, vessel of uh, life. That's what I'm grateful mm. for. And two days ago, we were with you climbing up and down for an hour to reach a waterfall. 
Boy, yeah, that was something. <laughs> you know, in Bali, the steps to climb to the temples or the mountains, they are about, you know, half a meter high. So you got to have really strong knees and knee muscles mm. to be able to make it. So I was very happy to see that all the fitness training and the yoga training that I did mm. and your compassionate hand <laughs> at times allowed me to go up and down pretty well. Mm. So thank you for taking me there. Yeah, thanks you for, for joining us. I want to ask you, so what's the what's your secret? What's the fountain of youth? What's Is it the bliss? fountain of youth? <laughs> hmm. I think that, you know, the fountain of youth is to know that it's that life can be life eternal and that awakening is a space in which we disappear as an ego, as a personality uh, who exhausts themselves by judging and by holding grudges and by you know having resentments and anger and this makes us get older and and when we basically understand that these things are illusions that we can notice them and we can let them go which isn't simple but it can be done uh, then we can emerge as a joyful being And all of a sudden, life is juicy. So I would say mm. that's my answer. Beautiful answer. Um, so yeah, coming to bliss, juiciness. What's um, what's your you feel your mission in the world? What's the world you want to live in? Your vision for it? Well, my mission basically was given to me when I was 17 and a half years old. And I made love for the first time and I had a totally cosmic orgasm, totally unexpected, where I dissolved completely as a bodily human being and I became pure light and that lasted for quite a while. And, um, you know, so I started to question what is the relationship between sex and spirituality? And then I went around the world to study the traditions of sacred sexuality Then I developed, uh, uh, you know, a method called Sky Dancing Tantra, which was founded by Padmasambhava and Yeshe Tsogyal in this 8th century Tibet. And actually, I didn't develop it. They gave me transmissions. Mm. And so this incredible orgasm was like the carrot given by God and goddess in front of the donkey to make me absolutely obsessively become a bliss hunter, become one that would find the ways to stabilize the experience of our full potential that is the bliss that we are capable of generating. And um, so slowly, slowly, I developed this method called the love and ecstasy training because I believe that as a therapist, which I trained as at the Sorbonne, as a psychologist, This uh, belief that in order to heal or to resolve a pain or a difficulty or a problem, uh, you know, had to do that, you have to go back to the source of it, that you go, usually go back to your childhood mm. and to your uh, difficulties with your parents. And after many years of doing that, I thought, this is way too, taking way too much time. And since I'm an impatient part, the sort, I decided to look for a shortcut. And then I developed a map uh, which was uh, enabling human beings to go directly from their sexual center to their blissful crown center. And in this way, I, in a way, rediscovered the ancient alchemy of the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. which taught us that Uh, you transform heavy metals into gold. So heavy metals is uncontrolled addictive libido, and gold is transmutation of this energy into light, into bliss. So that was my mission for a long time. And I work with some 40,000 people around the world, very dedicated. 
And now I've done my job. I've passed it on to other people. I have hundreds of people that train with me. I feel I fulfilled my mission. Mm. And so now I sat, you know, and, and asked myself, so what's next? And now I have something emerging here that maybe I want to start a company called The Ecstatic Conspiracy. We'll talk about that later, but, mm. you know, so I don't know what my new mission is, you know, but I do love teaching, as you could see yesterday. Yes, yes. And it was, that was uh, super interesting. Ecstatic conspiracy, we'll talk about this because uh, I, I think um, there's a lot to be said about how ecstasy can help um, bring a better world in a way. And, but just to talk about those methods to transmute that sexual energy, um, you know, without going into details, but can you give a little bit more details about what it entails? Well, okay, look at it this way. We know that uh, our energy centers that are sometimes called chakras in the yogic traditions uh, are basically uh, the, uh, the out-of-the-body subtle centers that uh, in a way correspond to our endocrine system. So our chakras are very, very important. And so if we start to channel, to open, the first point is to open a central channel in the middle of our body so that the sexual energy can be transmuted or channeled from the sexual center to the belly, to the power mm. center, to the heart, to the throat, to the third eye, and to the crown. And when this frequency vibration starts to change because we are transmuting, it is comparable to what could be said about musical instruments. If you're in the first chakra, it's like African, African drum. Da -da, da -da, da -da. It's otherwise called fucking. And we're really enjoying this primal need for mating, for penetrating each other, for going for it. And that's good. It's a healthy thing. I have no judgment about it. The only problem about it is that um, <clears throat> it's short-lived. You do it and you get kind of taken in this uh, place where you could compare it to peanuts. The more you eat them, the more you want them. So these short-lived uh, ejaculatory orgasms deplete you but they don't really satisfy because as soon as you're done within 10 minutes maybe half an hour at the most you know you want again because you know you're not really fully satisfied with this because mm. you stayed on the ground level it's like imagine taking an elevator mm. and you want to climb through first second and all the other floors mm. to get to the penthouse but your elevator says no i keep you on the ground floor no matter what yeah. I think uh, many of our listeners would be familiar, for example, with Menta Chia and the multi-orgasmic man. So similarly, <coughs> it's to move that energy from the lower chakra and move them up. Is that... Yes, yes, yes. It is also holding the seed for men mm. uh, and developing the art of relaxing in high states of arousal, mm. which is, you know, not easy because when a person gets aroused, their instinctual response is they want to go for it and they want to throw this energy out. So they want to resolve this kind of longing, this calling, this desire to come to the ultimate peak of the whole experience. So when you channel this energy to transform it, you have to have a certain discipline and you have to forego the instant, immediate um, you know, rather short-lived pleasure and uh, be willing to move to the higher chakras and have a completely different frequency vibration. It's like there you had drums, here on the heart you might have uh, violins, uh, here it's the song of the voice, uh, here is maybe the flute, and so on and so forth. And so I'd say... Uh, 
yeah, I mean, there's similarities, but there's differences because Montag Chia talks about the microcosmic orbit mm -hmm. and says you cannot go directly through the central channel. You have to go around. And I had once uh, quite a dis discussion with him where we disagreed because I said, you can go directly through the central mm. channel. And he said, no, 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 no. You know, the energy is too powerful. People will have headaches. And I said, mm -hmm. no, they won't have headaches if you bring the energy back down to, you know, the root, mm. which is what um, I do. And um, well, that, that speaks to me because that's something I've been practicing for a year. And it's definitely a challenge, but it's also very rewarding and worth it because contrary to what we may think at first, losing that pleasure of ejaculation, it opens the door to a lot more ecstasy, even in the bedroom, uh, through doing these practices like full body orgasms. And so I'm interested to ask you, do you agree that these practices are also beneficial for the pleasure of both partners? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a well-known fact that the timing factor is different for men and women. Uh, you know, usually, I mean, I'll now how do you say, I'll do a kind of a parody of the whole thing. It's not always like that. But men, typically, when they see a beautiful woman, have an erection and their Vajra is saying, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready, I want to go in the garden, I'm ready, I want to go now. And that can happen very quickly. In fact, some, some men c complain that they're, you know, they don't know what to do with this uh, inappropriate erection in the middle of some kind of gathering where it's not called for. You know, they want to go in the garden. Okay, so, and they're quick with it. Uh, and they're quick, why? Because the heart meridian in the man ends at the tip of his penis. So it's only when he has penetrated inside the sacred mandala, as the Tibetans call it, or the garden, that he can fully relax, let go, mm -hmm. and feel that his heart is opening. Now, on the other hand, for the woman, it's completely different. The woman first needs to open her heart. And, you know, once her heart is open, then that energy is trickling down into her yoni and eliciting uh, lubrication. But before she can lubricate, before she can feel her full desire, she has to take the time so that her little girl inside is wooed and charmed and, you know, uh, seduced. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, it takes time. It could take uh, one bouquet of flowers and another appointment and sweet talk and, you know, more adventures. And it could take forever, according to the man who really wants to get on with it, you know. But eventually, when they meet and they're ready, you know, it's great. So I'd mm -hmm. say, you know, um, that's my answer there. Uh, super interesting. I was um, also listening to a really good book, if you uh, listen to with my partner uh, by David Deda called Enlightened Sex. And they talked also about how biologically, also the men who would come more rapidly would reproduce more. And, and we come from that background, but obviously, that's not what most men want at the moment to reproduce as much as possible. That's true. So, so, That's so true. That was interesting. I also want to bring it to the ecstatic conspiracy because here we talk more about the love making and we all want to have ecstasy in the bedroom for sure. But it's super interesting your approach, how you can bring that to the everyday life because through this, for example, even personally through the practices of semen retention, I've learned a lot about delayed gratification, about holding my energy, and I feel it's something that can help in my professional life, my everyday life. And I know for you, um, the sexuality has also been a basis to learn about how to be blissful, ecstatic in the everyday world and also shape a better world through that. So do you want to be, talk a bit about the relationships? Yeah. yeah, so I would say that, uh, you know, this channeling of sexual energy that I was talking about earlier, this then brings us to a place where the energy first, when it gets to the third eye, so this is the orgasmic energy, this is the pleasure energy. And when we bring it to the heart, we feel like we're melting 
with each other, inside each other. We develop compassion. We mm -hmm. develop the feeling of being one with and the heart opens. And then when we move to the throat, we like to make noise to express and give a color to the energy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then we move to the third eye and the energy starts to expand beyond the boundaries of the body into a larger universe. And so we move into a place of spaciousness and meditation. And then when the energy, you know, if the central channel or the inner flute, as I call it, is open, uh, the energy goes to the crown and then that's the blissful part. And the blissful part is basically we feel that we're one with all that is. And we remember that if we dedicate this beautiful meditation to the bliss and the well-being of all our sisters, me the woman, in the world, you know, we're not just doing it for our selfish satisfaction. We are offering this light and this energy and this bliss to the healing of all the women on the planet. And when a man does it and channels his energy to this place, he must remember that he's offering this bliss, this wonderful, fine tuned vibration to the healing of all the men, you know, on the planet. So that's important. And then, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, bliss can have many dimensions, you know. Bliss doesn't have to come through sex because actually, once you get to the bliss of the crown chakra, I call it the orgasm of the spirit, that is so much more pleasant than the sexual orgasm that you begin to lose a certain amount of interest for the basis uh, orgasm or for the you know, <clears throat> the, uh, the root chakra, and you prefer to reside into the expansiveness of the, of the crown. So, but I would say that bliss is our potential as human beings. And I see that there are pockets of people in the world that are committing unwittingly or knowingly to create what I call now the ecstatic conspiracy. And so, okay, that's, I guess, my answer. Did I answer? Yes. And, and what's the ecstatic <coughs> conspiracy, Margot? I can't wait to hear about that. Well, okay, so for a long time, we as uh, human beings, uh, especially Westerners, uh, I think have been fighting and swimming against the anti-ecstatic current of our society that is telling us over and over again, um, you know, don't breathe, don't do this, don't do that, don't get together, don't touch each other. I mean, it's come to now to an extreme point of being completely ridiculous, if you ask me, but yeah. Um, so anyway, it's definitely anti-ecstatic. So at first, we were fighting this, and it's still many people are fighting it. But if you look at it, when you fight, you give importance to the object or the entity that you're fighting. You're saying, this is a real entity. This is where I choose to put my life force, my life energy, you know, mm. to go no, okay? But Tantra is not in the no. Tantra is in the yes. Tantra is in the let go and the surrender to the deepest potential of our blissful nature. So <clears throat> slowly, slowly, all those that were saying no, that were fighting, are realizing that it doesn't really get them anywhere. And it's not a pleasure. It's an effort. It's uh, exhausting. So they are now cultivating their bliss. And what happens when you cultivate your bliss, you wake up. Because every experience of bliss is a blink from God. And in this moment of bliss, you become timeless, you become egoless, and you realize that it's an ultimately attractive state of being. And you go even further and transcend the idea that it's a state of being, and you go to the place where it's your true nature. It's always there if you know how to cultivate and to connect the entry point to that reality. So now, 
um, so the people who were, you know, swimming against this anti-ecstatic current are now saying, okay, <clears throat> I woke up, I had many awakenings, many bliss states, enough times that I feel free to decide for myself and to honor my sovereignty as a human being with the right to decide for myself. And I will congregate with other people and I will get together with those of like, I would say, like, like, like blissfulness or like blissful cultivating potential and I will create a new world, a world that corresponds to the values that we want to live in, a world that honors nature, a world that is not completely enslaved by money, a world that realizes that these corporations that rule the world have very little interest in our well-being and much more interest in, you know, gaining more and more and more money, or at least that's the impression that we have. Now, you may not agree with me, but, you know. I think most of the listeners would agree, <coughs> knowing, knowing the audience. So, so by creating what I call the blissful, the ecstatic conspiracy, we are basically gathering together more and more often uh, to experience and cultivate our blissful potential to celebrate life, to celebrate joy, to celebrate and honor nature, to celebrate our gratitude to be humans on this planet. And that's the ecstatic conspiracy. And now we're at the beginning of this, I think. And the step which has not yet been quite resolved is how do we take the bliss, the, the momentary experience of bliss, and create a new world which is going to actualize, actualize our spiritual discoveries and mm. our blissful realizations into something tangible that, you know, covers our health, covers our emotions, covers our awareness, covers our relationship to each other, covers especially the way that we can survive, that we can thrive in such a world of the ecstatic conspiracy. Mm. So that is for each of us to meditate on this and to create this. I'm not the full answer to that. I'm just the one, one of the ones that is just uh, giving a little, um, how do you say, ignition mm. for people to have a few tips and tools to open up to this wonderful full potential. I love what you're saying, Margot, and that's uh, fully aligned with um, what I'm excited about and also the people I interview where we all have roles. And um, for example, I've had Sasha, who's more about raising awareness about what's happening. Then I have people talking about cryptos and blockchain where you can build foundation for that new us who talk about because what we want to do here is not only to have that spiritual revelation, as you said, but how do we ground it here? How do we create an earth that's a reflection of this, right? Yeah. And then, and then I really like how you bring, um, yeah, for, for you, it's really prioritizing that bliss because that's the vibration that is necessary. And then maybe it's all the people that also work on, on um, bringing this into manifestation in a way. Is, yeah. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I would say, but I would also say that we need to remember that, you know, we can go from one blissful workshop to another, as is happening currently in Ubud in Bali. But, you know, waking up is a tough, tough job. It's uh, not made for the faint of heart. You usually are challenged to go through the dark night of the soul. You are challenged to go to a place where you have to give up a lot of the things that you believed in. Uh, a lot of the attachments that you had uh, and you have to find yourself like the naked emperor in the uh, fairy tale, you know, now you have nothing. You don't have your costumes anymore. You don't, you might not even have your home. You might not even have your money. Uh, and this actually happened to me recently, recently, 
all my savings for the rest of my life, a big amount of money, you know, a lifelong saving disappeared. And I'm not the only one to whom mm. this has happened. And I'm very, very happy to announce here <laughs> that when I found out, I didn't blink and I didn't get depressed one single second. And I surprised myself. I really surprised myself. And I sat there, you know, in my usual joyful moment. And I said, wow, you know, so how, Margot, how are you going to live? You know, and then I had this answer. Existence and the universe will provide. They have always provided, you know, don't worry. It's okay. And, you know, today I'm thinking, well, maybe it was what the divine did so that I would get a kick in the ass to start a new company and, you know, explore a new level of work. So I don't know. But we do go through this dark night of the soul mm -hmm. and we do have to kind of, and that's what the COVID is doing. You know, that's actually a mutation. And if you didn't do your work, you're going to get, and if you're prior, pr previously not healthy and I honor those who came into this from that place who are aging and who are suffering. I honor them and I don't want to deny this reality. Okay. I don't want to, to say it doesn't exist. Okay. But <clears throat> there is also this other reality, which is that we are called to a mutation. And this mutation is either going to take us down into depression and whatever the programmation, you know, is leading us to, if that's what we choose. Or we are mutating into what I called the warriors of the light, okay? Or we are the, not the warriors, the mutants of light. In other words, we choose, you know, the free path of bliss, the free path of the light. And in so doing, we have to be capable of actualize this every moment of the day, which is not so simple. Mm -hmm. you know? So <laughs> definitely. And um, if I can share, Margot, I have a lot of gratitude for the people who stole your money. If that's a motivation for you <laughs> to create your show, The Ecstatic Conspiracy, and share your message to <laughs> the, the millions. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because um, I had kind of let let go of, uh, of many projects I had that were based on this budget. And I'd made my peace with it. And now today I got a letter from this whole organization saying, uh, amazing, very Balinese, it's a Balinese organization. Uh, and saying, we ask all our customers to be peaceful, to be compassionate, <coughs> and to give us the time to redress and correct our company. And we promise that the, what we're engaged in to get this money back is going to be back in your account by the 1st of May. Ooh, okay. Now, they have been telling us that since February. Okay, So do we want to believe them or not? But mm. I, I read this and I laughed and I thought, well, you know, ultimately, it's real, it's not real, it's true, mm. it's not true. We have to realize that there's always two sides to truth. Like there's two sides to the reality of the cosmos, day and night, sun and moon, love and hate. You know, it, it's just like that. So when you realize that, well, you get kind of detached, mm. you know, and even that becomes an illusion. And when you can be there, you're mm. happy. Well, jokes aside, Margot, I'm very impressed with how you could handle that in an embodied way, right? Because a lot of people talk about the things and equanimity of the mind, but some people, they talk about it and they meditate. But if you start having your money stolen or, <laughs> you know, I often talk about either business or intimate relationship, or there are things that are more triggering yes, about yes. the real test. So yeah. that was a real test of your equanimity and of the, the well, you know, to be honest, foundation of your bliss. Yeah, well, it come, to be honest, it didn't come in a whole ready-made package. I mm. did have my moments where I jumped up and down talking to my lawyer and said, you got to do something, you know, da, da, da. Mm. am I calling in the mafia to run after these people with sticks and hit them over the head? And, you know, and then I looked at all this and I thought, oh, well, you know, Let's see. 
And, uh, you know, then my lawyer called and said he had a cold. And I thought, okay, well, take care of your cold. And then the time is passing. And then I'm busy mm. with doing other things that I love. And so I kind of let it go. Well, mm -hmm. it will be there. It will not be there. But life goes on and all is great. Mm. Well, still congratulations on that yeah, for sure. Thank I, you. I want to... <laughs> Uh, shorten also the, the time between the moment things happen to me and the moment when I get over it and see the blessing in it. That's always a, yeah. um, wanting to, to shorten that moment yeah. almost. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Without repressing it, of course. So yeah, but I punching find, a pillow, shouting sometimes. Yeah, but you know, I have to tell you, I find that you're, you're a very sincere uh, person, that you are looking at this and, and really wanting to cultivate this awakening in a very sincere and uh, total way. So I appreciate that in you very much. Thank you, Margot. <laughs> and I've been uh, reading Osho almost every night for more than a year. And so he's been also more in, indirectly than with you, but an inspiration into let's say, being embodied and self aware in a way in the yeah. road to enlightenment yeah. rather than pretending that's right now mm. did you notice in the workshop we had yesterday that i played osho at the very end i did yeah. and he was saying i salute the buddha within you yes i loved it well now i've been in love with this quote uh, that i put into music with a musical background for probably 30 years mm. and uh, you know when i'm inspired i play it and it took me forever to suddenly have an illumination about this quote and think, wow, he's giving us the entire key to awakening in this quote, which he spoke at the time when you, we were a thousand people or more sitting in a big Buddha hall in India in his ashram while he was sitting on the podium, a little elevated, and it was his birthday. And everybody came to celebrate his birthday. And that's what he spoke to us. And mm. it literally holds a key to awakening. It's beautiful. It's really about acceptance. Yeah. I remember you told us when we were together in the, the jungle also what, what is love. And the first word that yeah. came through your mouth then to define love was acceptance. Yeah. Wow. Good memory. <laughs> Bravo. I, I drink your, your words and, and wisdom, Margot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You talked about uh, sometimes how it can be rough, the uh, awakening path and the dark night, night of the soul. I want to ask you about plant medicine because uh, you told me you've done ayahuasca maybe 15 times and, and tried a, a lot of different things. I also know uh, Osho, for example, he doesn't really advocate, um, well, in the books it's more about LSD, but drugs in general. I know you, you work with a lot of, um, people who might have a different opinion. Do you feel, and you talked also about being impatient and shortcut. So my opinion is that if it's, if it's calling you, and it's aligned with your path, uh, at least from my experience, I found that psychedelics, something like ayahuasca, for example, was kind of a shortcut in a way that helped me discover things what maybe enlightenment could look like and give that motivation is it something that was part of your journey well too? it's a it's a confusing thing you know um because there was a whole period in my life uh starting with the woodstock festival in america uh which i was there uh you know where i tried everything you know lsd cocaine uh hash uh marijuana you name it i tried it mm. Um, and then, you know, I worked with shamans, I went in the jungle, I took ayahuasca with the people that are in the original culture from where the plant is coming, mm. because I believe that's the best way. You told me you've done tantra on ayahuasca too. That's definitely on my bucket list. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, so, I mean, uh, yeah. And also San Pedro, you know, and mm. I believe that there is a number of rules that have to be followed or let's say guidelines for having a really good journey the first is the space you need to be in a beautiful safe space where you're going to have no disturbance mm. and where the vibrations have been cleaned mm. okay so you know you imbibe in this very sensitive moment yeah. something that is positive for your elevation 
uh, then you better try to not have animals around because animals, particularly dogs, you know, they're very sensitive to these shifts mm. in states of being and they might suddenly, you know, jump there and bark because you're going through something. And, and Margot, can I pose you, for example, I'd be super interested, especially to know for you, those experiences, if they've had an ah, impact in your life. Um, and if they, you felt like they've opened your mind and consciousness they did uh they did i also really explored ketamine with the creator of it that was john lilly okay. he was my lover at the time and oh. um he discovered the flotation tanks where you you know so yes it, there was a period in my life where definitely it was a very very interesting exploration Ketamine in a flotation tank. Oh my God, that's uh, the <laughs> ultimate, you know. Um, I tried and explored everything. That was my role, you know. And then I, I saw how possibly we can bring the tantric approach to that, you know. So yes, I would say it's a good thing if you do it properly. Mm. And, and if you have know. a good guide. <laughs> Because when you take these yeah. things you may all of a sudden fall into a very negative, fearful state of being mm. that you didn't expect at all. And if you don't have someone that draws you out of it with the music and with whatever they do, you know, the recitations, uh, you could have a very bad trip. And if you have a very bad trip, the entities are going to jump on you yeah. and they're going to take advantage of this and they're going to kind of walk into your field and occupy it. So as far as I'm concerned, I would say, yes, it was helpful. But then um, I thought that the shortcut has its limitation. Mm. And then I went into a year of wanting to see if I could achieve the same results, the same psychedelic insights without uh, taking shortcuts but in doing very intense yogic practices and going to ashrams and, you know, working on myself. And um, I thought, yeah, that in a way, the memory of the steps that you create and develop to arrive uh, at this blissful place is preserved in a more, in a better way than if you take something where you might be prone to forget quite quickly the, oh, you know, the, the very strong thing that you went through. Even though I would say it didn't quite happen like that for me. I remember, you know. So yeah. I'd say, yeah, um, it depends. You know, yeah. I don't have a straight answer. It depends. I, I think that's super, yeah. super enlightening, you know. And, and pretty and and the, you know the, the 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 danger is that then people get a bit addicted and they think every time they're gonna like devote some time to their growth then they prepare a cocktail of drugs and without the drugs they have other things to do you know and that is you know limiting in my estimation that you know enlightenment is not indulging in some drug mm. enlightenment is you know do your work repeat your practices you know, have some discipline, you know. I, I say, if you manage to work with a master, feminine or masculine, that is authentic as a guide, then that's also a blessing, mm. you know. Uh, it is a tremendous blessing. And I can say that, you know, I found myself walking down the streets of Paris 20 years after being with Osho, who now left the body, and suddenly I stopped in the middle of my step and I said, ah, that's what he meant. Mm. And I hadn't gotten it, I hadn't grokked it, but he taught me until 20 years later, you know. And so, you know, in India, they say when you work with a master, you become so yin, you so identify, you so surrender to the guidance of the master that the master stays in your heart and is always guiding you. So, you know, you may believe in that, you may not. I kind of did, but not always. Sometimes I wanted to run away and do my thing. But generally speaking, uh, if people could, you know, find a master and really go for it with a master, I think that's a shortcut that is 
very, very good. Mm. Thank you so much, Margot. We are approaching the end of that episode. And the idea here is for the listeners to get a, an essence of uh, what you do, who you are, what you stand for. And I think we, we capture quite a bit of that. But of course, we could, um, as you know, we've been speaking for hours and we could keep going. For the people who are interested and want to dive deeper into what you're doing, I'd love you to share a little bit more about maybe about your book to start with and also about the Ecstatic Conspiracy Project and your website. How can people dive deeper into your work? Well, <clears throat> I'd say that the first step is try to join a group or a seminar. Depending on which part of the world you're in, we have a sky dancing institute in Germany, we have one in uh, America, we have many in Switzerland and Europe. And is it only physical France. or also online? Online to some degree, yeah. We just finished a month-long online course mm -hmm. called Immersion. Um, but mostly, I have to say, we were definitely, you know, uh, up to recently on the path of seminars with live people. That's what we all like the best. Uh, but try to see if you can join a group because when other people are a mirror to yourself, your progression might be easier than if you're on your own. And... Um, so you can you can go and search the word sky dancing tantra and you will find uh many websites of the different sky dancing tantra institutes in these countries i mentioned and you can go to www margot anand in one word margot with a t margot anand dot com and there you will have my website with every possible information and links to the other uh, the other institutes. I, I hope that we did that by now. And you will also be able to uh, abonne, how do you say, subscribe to my library, which has a film with um, four and a half hours of 20 minute modules that are teaching you uh, the steps of sky dancing tantra. And actually, these modules uh, were shot with. Uh, the collaboration of 60 different uh, students in America who volunteered to uh, go through that. And it was a really fun, fun, fun exploration. And, um, and I would advise you, if you're curious about the roots of Tantra, to read my book, Love, Sex, and Awakening, because this is a book of stories, and it's a page turner. Uh, it's a story about 20 pages of an adventure each 20 page, uh, and each happens with a different partner in a different part of the world. And so it's an initiation adventure, which was a landmark into the creation of the love and ecstasy training. So it's a transmission. How do I get a transmission in this field of sky dancing tantra? This book is out fucking rageous. I can, I'm warning you, you know, uh, many people who read it say they couldn't stop. Because it's, yeah, I mean, you know, it's quite daring. But at the end of each chapter, I say, what did I learn from this adventure? And then I have a page and a half of the wisdom that I extracted from this teaching that I received. And uh, then there is a practice that you can do a meditation. And that's the book. And I really like it. So Love, Sex and Awakening, it's in French. À la rencontre de l'orgasme divin. Uh, it's in Bulgarian, it's in Dutch, and it's in German. And you can also go to Margot Anand. Be very careful because I'm generally all the time hacked. And when you Google or when you go to Margot Anand, they try to sell you all sorts of sexual products which have nothing to do with me. So be careful that you get to the authentic <laughs> Margot Anand and the authentic website. And we'll put the, the website in the show notes. Thank you so much. Margot, I'm super excited to read your book too. And um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to share with our listeners all the wisdom you've accum accumulated in dozens of years, uh, learning from the top masters and teaching with some of the top masters that you are part of too. So thank you so much. Margot, and I think it's a, it's a message that people really need in uh, the world of today. Yeah. Do you have a, a last word for the listener? Yeah, my last word is this. 
And that's my definition of sky dancing tantra. Listen carefully and embody it. Choose with awareness what brings you joy and it will open the door to your spirit. And that's a real big key. Choose with awareness what brings you joy and it will open the door to your spirit. Try it for size. You'll enjoy it. Aho. Aho. Thank you, Margot. Thank you to everyone who listened. Thank you for taking some of your precious time to listen to this podcast. If you stayed until the end, I assume it was insightful. If you like this podcast, please share with friends. Remember that if you tag us in your Instagram story at the Light Leaders Podcast, we will repost. Tell us what you've learned. You can also leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Now, if you think I can help you grow your soul mission business, you can register for a free 15-minute coaching call with me. Go to www.thelightleaders.org slash free call. Thank you again, and let's co-create the Conscious New Earth together.